We thank you for joining us for a special pre-recorded edition of WMKV Cares here on 89.3 and 89.9. We are on location for a recording that was done on October the 13th at the opening of a special exhibit called 12 Nazi Concentration Camps Photographs by James Friedman. It is on exhibit at the Skirball Museum at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion through January 29th of 2017. It is in partnership with the Center for Holocaust and Humanity Education. In this program, we will be talking with the photographer James Friedman, who created in the early 1980s some photographs of concentration camps throughout Europe that were riveting, controversial, visceral, and more. And we'll find out more about those particular photographs as we talk with Mr. Friedman. We will also be visiting with Abby Schwartz from the Skirball Museum and also with Sarah Weiss from the Center for Holocaust and Humanity Education here in Cincinnati. By the way, the exhibit, once again, is at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion at the Skirball Museum, 3101 Clifton Avenue. If you would like more details, you can call 513-487-3098. That's 513-487-3098. And this is also put on in conjunction with the biennial efforts of photo focus here in the greater Cincinnati area. We are here at the opening of 12 Nazi concentration camps photographed by James Friedman at the Skirball Museum at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. And we have the director of the Skirball Museum here, Abby Schwartz. And Abby, this is a very poignant and I think in some ways maybe a surprising exhibit for some people because we think of the Holocaust and all the films we see are in black and white, all the pictures that we've seen from the Holocaust are in black and white. But these are more modern photographs by Mr. Friedman from the early 1980s. Yes, that's correct. So this is a little bit different for some people, but it still brings out incredible emotion. Yes, I totally agree. And you have really landed on one of the major themes of this show in that for most of us, and I'm a baby boomer, so my experience of the Holocaust, my Holocaust memory is in black and white. And these photographs are... 16 by 20 inches in beautiful color that is unchanged from when these photographs were made in the early 1980s because he used a process called dye transfer, which is one of the most permanent archival types of photography. No one does it anymore. So they are painstakingly made and they are beautiful color and they reflect really the clash of modern culture, modernity, and the sort of mundane and ordinary with these hallowed, sacred places of Holocaust memory. In fact, this is a coup in some ways for Skirball Museum because this has been called one of the most important photographic records of concentration camps in the post-Holocaust era. It is an extraordinary opportunity for us, and it was made possible partly because of our involvement with Photo Focus, which is the biennial celebration of photography in the Cincinnati region, and we were fortunate to receive a grant from Photo Focus to bring this show. And I was lucky enough to have been called on by a friend of Jim's who introduced me to these photographs and then introduced me to Jim, who has been my collaborator my partner in crime, so to speak, for lo these many months until we were able to mount this exhibition. For those people who may not be familiar with James Friedman, you call him Jim, he has a fascinating story. Can you share a little bit of what you've learned from the Skirball perspective on this wonderful photographer? I I absolutely can. Jim grew up in Columbus, and one of the things that he told me early on when we were having our lunches and coffees and starting to really think about this show was that as a child, he experienced anti-Semitism and had a neighbor who was particularly very in their anti-Semitic behaviors and there were incidents with damage to Jim's home and he experienced that as a child. And then later in his life, actually between his two trips to Europe to photograph 12 Nazi concentration camps, he was denied tenure at Ohio State University because he was Jewish. He asked me to speak with colleagues because he didn't want it just to be his story. And I spoke with colleagues who were part of his circle and outside his circle, and all of them sort of 
pushing the envelope and doing things that were kind of avant-garde, and they were all sort of lumped together, not all of them Jewish. At the point where a tenure decision was being made, he was denied tenure, and words had actually been spoken about there being enough Jews on the faculty. And in all fairness to Ohio State University, we do want to say that that 1984 religious discrimination lawsuit was settled out of court with no one found at fault. So it still speaks to a time when there were alleged quotas of so many different organizations, so many different companies, so many different, even civic groups, that might well have had certain quotas or certain restrictions on who could be members or who could reach higher levels. There were lots of quotas for all kinds of schools, medical schools, still that was still happening in the 70s and 80s, and it's not talked about a lot, and it certainly isn't something he wants to dwell on or talk about himself, but it certainly informed his view of his own Jewish self and continues to inform how he looks at the world. These are powerful images. We're talking with Abby Schwartz about 12 Nazi concentration camps, photographs by James Friedman. It is on exhibit at the Skirball Museum at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion through January the 29th. Tell us a little bit more about the Skirball Museum. I think for many people, it's still one of the best kept secrets in Cincinnati. How can people find out more and how can they get here? The Skirball Museum is, as you said, on the historic Cincinnati campus of Hebrew Union College on Clifton Avenue. We are the repository of a wonderful collection of Judaica artifacts and art, ranging from ancient times all the way to modern and contemporary Israeli and American art. We are also recently the recipients of the B'nai B'rith Klutznik National Jewish Museum's collection, which was transferred to us in 2015, expanding our collection, bringing to us nearly 1,500 objects, quadrupling our collection, and we are constantly opening boxes, condition reporting, and putting on display some of the most important pieces from that collection. Running concurrently with this show is something that really gives quite a bit of counterpoint. It's an exhibition of 18 tiny treasures from the B'nai B'rith Klutznik collection, which George is very familiar with because his daughter daughter was very involved in putting it together. But these are tiny, diminutive works of art that really show the craft and the artistry of the makers in, in making these tiny treasures. And coming back to the photos for just a moment as we'll move around here, we're kind of on the red carpet here at the (laughs) opening day for the 12 Nazi concentration camps, the photographs of James Friedman. I know art is very near and dear to your heart, Mm -hmm. and there is a great deal of art in here. This man self-taught as a photographer, which is amazing. Well, initially. Then he went to Ohio State, and then he he went on to get an MFA in San Francisco, so yeah. Exactly. (laughs) But it's tremendous. And there will be many other programs programs geared around the 12 Nazi concentration camps as well. We have a wonderful partnership with the Center for Holocaust and Humanity Education. They bring to the table and raise the bar significantly for us by virtue of their educational resources and their knowledge about Holocaust memory. So it's been a wonderful partnership. And through this partnership, we've established a lunch and learn with Jim Friedman. At the end of October, we're going to have a program in mid-November where we are going to be welcoming two Holocaust survivors. Both of these men were in the concentration camps that are shown here. One is Auschwitz, one is Mauthausen, and they are going to talk about their own art forms, their writing, sketches, their drawings, their film, as primary witnesses of the Holocaust in contrast to what is secondary witnessing in these photographs. Jim did not experience the Holocaust, but reacts to it nonetheless. Uh, There's also going to be a panel discussion in early December with leading scholars on the issue of the Holocaust and popular culture. This whole concept of showing these hallowed places, these sacred places in color, raises a lot of questions about our culture today, about Pokemon Go at sacred sites, about selfie sticks at the 9-11 memorial, about food and drink and gift shops. I mean, these are all things we grapple with in museums and in memorials of all sorts, including Holocaust memorials, and this will be the subject of that panel. 
the closing day of the exhibition. Very which, important day. Which also coincides with International Holocaust Remembrance Day. There will be uh, an opportunity to see the show for the last time and to hear Mark Leno, who is a senator and was the first elected gay man to serve in the state of California and was very involved with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in developing their LGBT exhibition because not only were Jews persecuted, but people who were outsiders for any number of reasons or considered outsiders. So that will be an interesting and compelling program on the closing day of the exhibition. Abby Schwartz, I want to thank you for taking a few moments here with us before the grand opening here. And again, the exhibit will be open through January 29th. It is 12 Nazi concentration camps photographs by James Friedman. It is riveting. It is visceral. It is something that it really, really hits you a little bit hard, but it is something to make you think. And it's the next closest thing possibly to going to the Holocaust Museum in D.C. or in Jerusalem. Every one of these sites, every one of these opportunities to explore this this material is going to be different. And uh, at, at, a, at a museum devoted to the Holocaust, you're really going to see a much more historical approach. But nonetheless, looking at it through this photographer's lens and experiencing this kind of response to this horrific period in history in the early 1980s during the Cold War at sites that were not yet really dealing with educational and interpretive models, this was really sort of a moment in time that really can't be experienced any other way. Amy Schwartz, thank you so much for taking time here with us. My pleasure. If you're just joining us on WMKV Cares, this is a special pre-recorded program that was recorded on October 13th at the grand opening of 12 Nazi concentration camps, photographs by James Friedman. It is confrontational. It is unpredictable. It is a series of photographs taken in the early 1980s at 12 different concentration camps throughout Europe. And in this program, we'll also be talking with the photographer who was here for the grand opening of this exhibit. Once again, the exhibit is at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, 3101 Clifton Avenue at Mayerson Hall in the Skirball Museum. And you can find out more at 513 513- Four eight seven three zero nine eight. We are here recording live at the opening of the 12 Nazi concentration camps photographs by James Friedman exhibit here at the Skirball Museum at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. This program could not be possible without the support and the cooperation with the Center for Holocaust and Humanity Education. We have Sarah Weiss here with us. And Sarah, I know I was talking to Abby. The center actually has an incredible exhibit as well and an incredible way for people to learn more about the Holocaust. And the center is pleased to be a sponsor in this incredible exhibition. Hope we'll get an opportunity to talk about the photographs and what they mean in terms of Holocaust memory and history and education. But the center has a permanent exhibit called Mapping Our Tears, which features the stories of local Holocaust survivors, liberators and rescuers, their artifacts, their testimonies, the timeline, and gives as best as possible a complex nuanced introduction to the Holocaust in an interactive setting located in Sycamore Township. Is there a way people can find out more about the center and what hours they can come out to see Mapping Our Tears? The exhibit is open to the public Monday through Friday, 1 to 4 p.m. and Sundays, 11 to 3 p.m. Anyone can learn more on our website, www.holocaustandhumanity.com. Org, and we welcome welcome people to visit. We also have a lot of school groups that come and welcome visitors anytime. We are here with Sarah Weiss from the Center for Holocaust and Humanity Education. What's your reaction on the photographs of James Friedman? Many of us have had a chance to see them on our phones or on a computer, mm-hmm. but we're actually here in the gallery and we're getting to see these up close. We have color photographs here. The faces, everything from survivor reunions to just families who happened to be visiting these camps in the early 1980s when these were taken, the different reactions of people is something. I mean, you're used to seeing people who may be on a vacation or may be visiting somewhere, and you have that photograph and everybody's smiling. It's not the case here, and it it kind of grabs you by the gut a little bit. Yeah, definitely. These photographs are extremely powerful and gripping, and we've been 
looking through them and preparing for this exhibit for quite some time, but seeing them on display here at the Skirball Museum adds an additional dimension. These are not the iconic photographs. When we think of photographs of the Holocaust, as you said, we think of images of black and white. But not only that, we think of either images of black and white of liberation, photographs taken primarily by American, British, Russian soldiers at the very end of the war with people who, who look emaciated and sad, horrible, depressing photos. Or we think of also images of barren places, empty sites. But these photographs taken 40-some years after the Holocaust under communism offer a very different glimpse of what the sites were at that time in the 80s and also challenge our thinking about what's the future of these sites and what is the way in which people commemorate and remember and pass on the lessons of the Holocaust. These photographs really conjure up a lot of questions. Each one of them tells a different kind of story. They're photographs that are sometimes hard to take because they're images of places that we believe should be sacred sites. They're places of death and destruction. And at the same time, you see in some cases a child or people eating lunch or things that just yes. don't seem like the they non fit. Non sequiturs, right? Yes. yes. And at the same time, they're happening. And what does that mean? Why is that happening? And what does that mean today? And what does that mean of the sites of the Holocaust for the future? And so I think there's so much each one of these photographs offers to, for us to think about the past, the present, and the future of Holocaust remembrance and memory and really that collective memory. Well, we certainly want people to be involved not only with the Skirball Museum at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, but also the Center for Holocaust and Humanity Education. I'd love to share one additional thing yes. that as a complement to this exhibition, we actually have a special exhibition in addition to Mapping Our Tears, which I spoke about earlier. We have a complementary exhibition that's going to be opening on November 9th, which is called Through Their Lens. And it's actually going along this theme of sites of the Holocaust. It's a crowdsourced exhibition. So we put out a call locally wow. to individuals who have visited sites of the Holocaust and asked people to submit their photos along with their reflection that goes along with why this photo is powerful or what story is it telling. We had over 60 submissions, both locally and actually we had a few submissions internationally, and we selected about 24 photos that are going to be installed on November 9th. Again, from local individuals primarily, reflecting on their experiences through photography. Well, it's all part of never forget. Yeah. That's what the message is here. And whether we like the way people might be eating at one of these locations or one of these sacred spaces, people are still going there and they are still remembering, which yeah. is important. So yeah. Thank you, Sarah, thank so much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. We are here, in effect, on the red carpet at the opening of 12 Nazi concentration camps, the photography of James Friedman. And we are here with James Friedman. Mr. Friedman, thank you for taking a few moments with us. Abby Schwartz was telling us some of your background. I want to jump to these incredible photographs. What was your initial inspiration for these photographs in this exhibit? My initial inspiration was my childhood that was unfortunately besotted by a number of anti-Semitic acts towards me and my family. And unfortunately, we really didn't speak out about them or respond to those things in the 50s, and we just sort of went along. So as I got older and I continued to experience bigotry, at some point I said, I'm going to go to those places that emboldened the people who expressed that bigotry toward us, confront them, picture them, and no longer be silent. So this, was, in some ways, was a catharsis for you, I take it. Oh, absolutely it was. It was more than I bargained for. It was, uh, wasn't was easy to do, and uh, six different countries and 12 different camps. The problem is not what I just said about going to those places. If everybody wants to go to Europe, I suppose, at some point. The problem was that as I w went to them, there was an accumulation of a residue of evil yes. and menace that I felt permeated me. And it was difficult to deal with. And so, for instance, I went to, when I was at Dachau, which was 15 minutes from Munich, it was difficult to turn off having been at Dachau when after the day's photography was done and going to dinner at a German restaurant in Munich it was difficult for me to to step away from that. 
Was this your first visit when you were taking these photographs in the early 80s? Was this your first visit to each one of these camps? Yes, it was. I went in 1981 and photographed at nine camps and then had intended to go to Poland to photograph the most notorious camps, the, the death camps. But at that point, uh, martial law was enacted in Poland, uh, you may recall. And while the State Department said, we have no problem with you going in uh, and photographing, doing what you need to do, we're not sure we can get you out. So I decided not to go. (laughs) So uh, two years later, I, I went back because the project would have been incomplete without camps in Poland. To me, it would be humbling if someone said this about me, but it... Your work here, the most significant body of photographic work on concentration camps in the post-Holocaust era. I was overwhelmed by that, uh, by that sentiment, that remark. It was in, it's in a very wonderful book. It's called The Holocaust and the Art of Secondary Witnessing. The author is Dora Appel, who's an incredibly brilliant art historian. I understand that there was a lot of, I guess, consternation might be the word about using color photography. Uh, You kind of broke the mold of what most people think of when we think of documentaries or any kind of documentation of the Holocaust. Everybody's thinking in black and white. You actually chose the majority of these are in color, beautifully done even though it was a difficult circumstance and these were difficult places to shoot, I don't mean from a technical aspect, but from an emotional aspect, the color was important to you. My idea is that all of us, whether we're Jewish or not, have in our heads an archive of Holocaust images from which we learned about that event. And so I thought, well, most of the people doing photography of the Holocaust after the war do pictures that are fairly predictable, black and white, grainy, people-less, and usually perhaps have a raven in the picture. And so that was done and done well by by some terrific photographers. My idea was to juxtapose that idea of somber, elegiac photographs of of the sites after the war and juxtapose those with the contemporary world, which I saw and see as being in color. And so, again, these are mundane scenes, some of them. Some of them are surprising in what they are. There's horror in the detail about what they picture in terms of the captions or the explanations. But for me, what I think the viewers find difficulty and discomfort in overlaying my pictures onto their archive of black and white photographs of the Holocaust and what they know happened there. And in some ways, you're creating a whole new archive for people in today's technology and today's color. With many of these people, you were taking these photographs. Did you have an opportunity to talk to some of these people? And was there any reaction that left you profoundly affected by what people said who were there? Well, it varied. Uh, There were some members of the Dutch resistance who were attending a survivor's reunion at a place called Natzweiler Struthof near Strasbourg, France. And I did speak to them uh, at great length. And one of the things that struck me about that camp in France was that there was no mention of Jews having been there at all. And I asked them, I said, well, what's what's this about? Certainly there were Jews here. And they said, yes, they didn't understand that. And they explained to me uh, about the nature of that camp and the fact that Jews had been killed there. They told me that they come back almost yearly at that time. They had come back almost yearly from around the world. And this kind of bond that they had was really quite moving to me. And that was important there. Then other things I dealt with in terms of some of the subjects in the photographs were that if you were a professor from America, they thought that it was almost like you were a rock star. Whereas in America, if you're a professor of anything, you're uh, a criminal, almost. (laughs) So um, it's a very different way of viewing (laughs) academia and what that means. But 30 years ago, photography was different, and people were willing to interact with me photographically and have their pictures made by me, and there wasn't much suspicion about that. And there, there certainly is now in all kinds of contexts. I have to ask a final question, if I could. You will always be marked by what happened in your childhood, by what happened in your professional life. 
by this project, has the catharsis been anywhere near complete, or do you see this as still kind of a work in progress? I see it as a work in progress. It's difficult to, uh, for me to resolve all of that. There's a lot of things to deal with. But one of the things that's most surprising about having the exhibit and working on it for the last year and a half, two years with Abby Schwartz and incredible museum here, is that I've been inspired to really seriously consider going back and doing more work. I've been encouraged by some people at the Holocaust Museum that few people had done it before the fall of communism, and this was done during the communist era. And going there now and photographing at some of the same camps and others would, would show a very different nature of the place and who goes there now. And I'd like to combine that, if that's possible. James Friedman, I want to thank you for taking a few moments with us, not only sharing your work, but sharing a glimpse of your soul as well. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. On this program, we want to thank Abby Schwartz from the Skirball Museum, as well as Amanda Zahn. I also want to thank Sarah Weiss from the Center for Holocaust and Humanity Education, also Photo Focus. And we want to thank James Friedman for offering some of his time here on WMKV Cares. Again, this exhibit, a very important photographic exhibit, 12 Nazi concentration camps photographs by James Friedman, is running at Skirball Museum through January 29th. You can find out more at 513-487-3098, or you can Google Skirball Museum Cincinnati. That's S-K-I-R-B-A-L-L Museum Cincinnati. You've been listening to WMKV Cares.